Few people would dispute the fact that there's eroding trust in the media, more specifically in journalists and journalism. This is borne out by Afrobarometer, a pan-African non-partisan perceptions research index, which basically concludes that democracy and freedom are generally in decline in Africa. Why should we be worried about this? Not only is journalism fighting for life and sustainability now, but it's as much, if not more, concerning that people are turning their backs on hard-won media freedoms, generally regarded as the backbone of democracy. So we wanted to find out a little bit more about what young people are thinking when it comes to these rising levels of distrust in media and what this may mean for the future of democracy. I'm Gwen Lister, host of this Free Speak podcast of the Namibia Media Trust, in which we talk about all things media. And you can listen to us on SoundCloud and iTunes. So with me today to discuss this important topic are two very well-informed young people. Firstly, Ndapwa Alwendo, freelance writer, editor, and analyst, who in her own words is passionate about feminism and mental health in Namibia. And Omar van Rienen, civil rights activist and co-founder of Equal Namibia. Welcome to you both and thanks so much for taking time. Thanks for having me, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. It's an honor to be here. Thank you both. So the first question to both of you, and maybe shall I start with uh, Ndapwa? I'd like to ask both of you when, how, and where you access your news, and what are your most trusted sources of information? So when it comes to accessing news, I think, first of all, I definitely don't go to Twitter first, right. or anything that comes to me via WhatsApp, I'm very suspicious of. Right. Um, so generally, I will try to read the actual print newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, I'm not able to read like the Republican or Allgemeine Zeitung. My German and Afrikaans are not at that <laughs> level. Although I would be very interested to see what's how things are presented there. Um, but generally, I, f I try to read print media, and then I will then turn to Twitter and see number one what those um, newspapers have been tweeting from their content and how people are engaging with it to sort of see how people are taking it and get a bigger picture. Right. So yeah. you make sort of comparisons and. Yeah, Compare because I, I, don't, I don't think that I can rely on just one newspaper to, to okay, get everything. I don't enough. think it's necessarily wise um, for me. And so I try to do that once a day because I just know that if I'm constantly looking at the news, then I'm a giant ball of anxiety. So, yeah. Dapu, quickly before I turn to Omar, uh, radio, television doesn't feature much in no, your news? No, not really. Uh, television, not so much. Um, when it comes to local news, I don't really watch the news in the, in the evening because I think by the time the day has passed, I've kind of seen what's been going on. Okay. Um, but for international news, I mean, I think I grew up in a household where it was like CNN, Sky yeah. News, BBC. Um, so um, those are kind of, you know, I feel always kind of reliable. And then I, I really enjoy Al Jazeera for kind of a broader Different look. Different perspective yeah, too. And to not so, yeah, not so, you know, North America and Europe focused. Yeah. yeah. Emma, what about you? Yeah, so I grew up in, you know, in Naraval, Wolfish Bay. Right. In a colored household and with an uh, opa that was very much like new centered. Okay. And I think that really opened um, my eyes to uh, what's happening in the world and to become more um, interested in um, effecting change or just seeing a lot of the injustices uh, being reported. But um, I access my news uh, through my grandfather and grandmother's influence uh, through television. Okay. And it wasn't uh, it was until I went to go study in the States at the State University of New York that I am like up to here with CNN. Like I, 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 I they are a very wide reaching um, news station, but I can see that it's a lot of profit over integrity or profit over um, real journalism and okay. um, or journalism at the heart of what matters most. So uh, when I came back uh, from the States or while I was in the States, I discovered Vice News. 
And Vice News is very much like a youth-centered uh, approach about how they can present news to the youth, how the youth consume, um, you know, short videos that right. are easily digestible and you can unpack it easily. Uh, so and Vice, that's online, of course. Right? Online, on online. YouTube, on HBO. Okay. Um, so I access a lot of my news through them and they are very much on the ground, grassroots, what is happening, you know, like in the middle of the protests, in the middle of the arrests, you know. So so um, I'm very grateful to have found them. Otherwise, I am unfortunately very susceptible to social media news, um, but I am aware of the clickbait titles. Right. And um, I've also stopped reading any comments at all, especially when it pertains to the issues that, or the social justice issues that I'm advocating for. Right. Because I know that's anecdotal uh, perceptions of people's viewpoints, and I, I don't want to take that as like, this is how people feel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've even tried to, you know, in the month trying to lead some of my social media apps, but it's hard for as a young person one and as uh, for the work that I do as well. But um, I am very much uh, receptive to TV news, uh, especially Vice News, okay. especially on YouTube. And then what about your local news content? It's obviously a no from you for newspapers, right? Um, not a no. Okay. I love the uh, the reporting that's happening here, um, especially in local newspapers. And okay. especially coming from the States, I'm, I'm glad to see that it is going strong. And I know COVID has brought a lot of challenges. Um, but it's just not... Um, feasible to uh, purchase the newspapers every day okay. but I do like to do it as like a little treat for my grandmother if I go to the store you know like here's the local news and then I read it too okay. um, but since coming back from the states I've been um, investing my time more into local news and I think it is my responsibility to especially in the work that I do to ingest more local news um, instead of international news okay. as well. So you're mainly an online person, but you mainly circumspect online. about it. Yes, and my online is also received, uh, or what is on my online is also local, new, local news as well. Cool. The Afrobarometer uh, research, I'm not sure if either of you are familiar with it, is really quite eye-opening. Um, in Africa, I was astounded to see journalists are trusted about as much as politicians. So roughly 50% of those polled see both as equal sources of disinformation. And in Namibia, it's actually much higher. And 64% of those polled in Namibia believe journalists spread false news, compared to, for example, a very low figure in Tanzania of 16%, which is curious, but we probably don't have time to go into that now. But does this distrust that seems to be mirrored in this research um, does it um, echo your own views or your thoughts about why you think distrust seems to be so pervasive in Namibia? Because it doesn't seem that either of you or so far have articulated that you distrust the media, you just check multiple sources and, and are more circumspect. Dapua, let's start with you. Um, so I think when it comes to uh, the question of whether I trust the media or not, or what I think this stat kind of implies, um, as much as I consume as, as a wide range of, of local media, I don't necessarily consume it um, with the idea that it's giving me all the information that I need. I know that there are a lot of limitations to what local media can produce, not only in terms of like the capacity of newsrooms, and uh, but also you know every kind of newspaper might have its own bias or its own focus. So I think that for me, uh, the idea of trust is linked to me. Um, is linked to the media giving me the information that I need to make an informed decision. Right, right. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of a lot of media because I, I'm always a little bit suspicious that maybe something isn't being, isn't being um, included or maybe certain perspectives aren't being included. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that for a lot of people, making that distinction between a news source that just gives you sort of the bare bones facts and a news source that gives you real critical analysis is where I think a lot of the um, the tension lies. Okay. So for me, I, I feel that there's a lack in, in a lot of local media, again, because of these pressures um, of that critical analysis. Like it's not right. necessarily enough to say that today, this politician said this and another politician said this, right. and then the same analyst we always speak to said this. Right. Um, because not only is there not a variety of voices being presented, but there's also not like 
enough contextualization of what that actually means, you know? Yeah. Often you really need for the journalist to express that it's important that this politician has said this because in the past they said something completely different. Right. And, you know, make those comparisons. So, I mean, obviously it's a huge burden on journalists because you need to be aware of politics, you need to be aware of history, sure. you need to have access to all that information, you need to have the time. Um, so, it, you know, I think it's difficult to really trust in media when you know that um, the capacity sometimes isn't there. Right. Yeah, which right. is it's kind of sad. It's not necessarily that I, you know, don't like certain um, local media outlets or, or anything like that. It's just that I don't think that they can give what's really needed, which is that information to make, you know, informed decisions, right. especially when it comes to, you know, things like democracy and mm -hmm. the concept of democracy and, you know, voting and, and that sort of thing the media plays such a huge role in making sure that people really understand who candidates are and what parties stand for and what their actions have actually been. But again, you know, there's only so much that newsrooms can do. Can do. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, it sort of strikes me that at one point, I mean, years ago, uh, newspapers, for example, were the be-all and end-all. You know, it was just about newspapers and journalism, really, as far as news was concerned. I mean, radio was there, but it was always playing music, and it wasn't really invested in the news cycle. And I wonder whether journalism has changed a lot now with the onset of the digital age. I mean, before, you had to read the newspaper and find out what happened in Parliament. Nowadays, you can turn on NBC and you can watch live broadcast from Parliament. So why would you read the newspaper when you can watch it? So it seems to me newspapers are sort of morphing into probably developing more to community-based reporting and investigative reporting, which is difficult to do in other mediums. But that may have some resonance in these very depressing, I think, uh, survey results. But what about you, Omar? No specific distrust of journalists. I'm not hearing that from Ndapwa. She's circumspect about her media whatever she consumes, but she doesn't specifically distrust journalists yourself? Yeah. Uh, to a point that um, Dabwa said, that there should be better like um, like research done sure. in, the, in the local newspapers and media. And I do agree with that so that people can draw like analogies, like what has this member of parliament said at that time versus now? And even in the LGBTQ movement, like I'm throwing out the receipts, like yeah. the same minister that's violating our rights with the same minister who removed sexual orientation from the sure. report. And it's just sure. like, these are things y'all are supposed to know. But I do understand that um, they, uh, the the media industry is also very much underfunded and COVID has brought a lot of strains. Correct. But I think that there's so much potential here. We have a good reporting, especially compared to other African nations, right. but we can do better. So let's hold that standard for ourselves. Right. But I do not believe at all that the journalists and the government um, or the journalists promote misinformation right. in this country as a whole. Um, not at all. I actually think we should uh, applaud uh, the journalists throughout the board for the work that they have done. However, there are some shortfalls, especially from some new stations that have really made me question their credibility. And new stations, um, any sort of media out there in this country, they have to know that they have an obligation and a responsibility to report Absolutely. facts, right. to report, um, to disseminate misinformation. And I've seen the harms of that in the States. Fox News is dangerous. Dreadful. It is absolutely dangerous. It is indoctrinating. And I'm seeing certain news um, stations move towards that in a sort of like tabloid sense, TMZ. Absolutely. Um, if yep. I may mention, just a quote sure. some, um, it was so disheartening to see um, the villager who's also part of Eagle FM who have given the LGBTQ community multiple airtime, multiple space. I felt so safe going on there and talking about our issues. Right. But to see them in the newspaper then report about virginity and uphold sexist and misogynistic um, uh, um, perceptions of women. And then um, uh, there was one report that they talked about uh, a, a, a church that is putting in rectal medicine. And then they quoted saying, is the world turning into Sodom and Gomorrah? How is that is so negligent? And that is basically using a religious homophobia to incite violence right. against a minority right. group. Right. Right. And that was when I was like, well, 
there's no credibility here. There's no legitimacy here if this is what you're doing. You're reporting clickbait. You're you're just uh, trying to create a, what is called sensationalism, so right. to say. Right. And I expect it better. But now what happens and why people think that the journalists and the government aren't part of uh, spreading misinformation because there is some um, create, uh, accountability that the government must be held to um, misinformation, especially pushing the media away if the right. narrative is not in their favor right. and blanketing that as that's a lie, that's misinformation. But um, the reason why it's dangerous what the villager does is because people look at that and then they paint all the other media stations the, With same, the same way. Brush. Exactly. Right, right. And I think that's a good point. You know, the state of journalism is only as good as the journalists who practice it. Exactly. And yes, there's definitely a tendency these days. I mean, there is serious media that take the facts uh, seriously and who serve their public and try to deliver the facts and the truth mm -hmm. in as far as they're able to do so. But of course, then there is that other media that is now saying in order to sustain, we need to be like social media mm -hmm. and we need to drop standards and become clickbait ourselves. Yeah, which is fine. Okay, if that's the avenue you want to take as the village or Eagle Then you know not fine. to consume that media. Yes, yeah. personally. But then what do we call you then? Are you a new station then? Right. Do I hold you on the same level as the Namibian, as the Namibian Sun? Yeah. Or are Absolutely. you just, like I said, a tabloid then? Right. What do we call you? Where do you fall? Right. And I think that, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people who both read the newspapers um, and uh, follow news agencies on social media, there's often this weird discrepancy in terms of the quality of content that is being sure. put out on social media. And uh, it's, it's almost as if you know, a lot of newspapers and local media need to have a very clear understanding of how social media is used to spread news Absolutely. as opposed to just information. Absolutely. Because I think that, like Omar was saying, there is a certain obligation to the way that information is presented uh, and the way that, um, you know, there's accountability uh, for newspapers for, you know, the way that they present information, the way um, you know, you know, you've seen newspapers or, or news outlets, um, you know, reporting on people's death and using really graphic, triggering images, and people will, you know, call them out in the comments and 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 complain. But there's not even any response often exactly. or any change. And I think that that's something that people need to take very seriously because a lot of people are turning to um, newspapers, Twitter accounts first before buying the newspaper. Absolutely, as Omar says, not everyone can buy all the newspapers every day. Right. So I just think that uh, for news agencies going forward, especially when we're looking at these distrust figures, right. taking very seriously how social media and how your social media platforms are set up and structured and regulated and monitored mm. is going to be so important going forward. Right, mm. absolutely. And I think, uh, well, social media and journalism, that's definitely a lot of people, what it really leads us to, to, to think about is, of course, media literacy. And the two of you are clearly media literate and you're able to make your choices and base those choices on informed uh, information that you have. A lot of people aren't that way. So they believe everything is true that is on Facebook, for example, um, and things like that. So I think, again, there's, there's probably a lot of work to do uh, in this new digital area with media coming at you from all sides. How do you choose which is the best medium and you don't simply just consume and believe disinformation? Because that is dangerous mm -hmm. to democracy. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just to, to, to go slightly off tangent here, I think worse than the, of some of the survey I've uh, cited up to now, over 40% of Africans feel that government should censor criticism of the president and news that government disapproves of. Mm -hmm. And this is horrifying for me. Yet in Namibia, nearly 60% of those polled believe that the internet access should be unrestricted. Well, it happens, I believe, the same. But generally, it seems that most people have a more benevolent approach to disinformation on social media than they would, for example, be towards the print media or what we call traditional media, most of whom and which are responsible outlets are part of the system of self-regulation and they submit themselves to a code of ethics and so on. The, the newspaper you referred to earlier, I don't believe they are part of that system. So that may be another parameter by which to, to judge uh, the media. Any thoughts around, around that, that sort of scariness of people turning their backs on democracy and those freedoms that were so 
hard won, um, people now seem to be able to just, and they don't make the connection between media freedom and their own freedoms. Because we all know that when media freedom goes out the door, personal freedoms of everyone else follow suit very quickly. Exactly. Any thoughts about that? And Dapu, let's start with you. It's a biggie. <laughs> so. It is a biggie. Uh, and I think it's it's really worrying to to me. I mean, as a, I, I guess technically I'm still defined as a youth by the government, but oh as a person who's, you know, grown up technically a, a born free, I guess you could, you could call me, um, seeing the evolution of how people um, consume the news and respond to the news, I think has been very, very interesting sure. because uh, there has definitely been a shift towards um, most uh, and newspapers, for example, being more openly critical of uh, the government, whereas in the past, I think it was extremely scandalous when people would critique the government. And um, like from personal experience, I know because I wrote what I thought was a very, very um, soft think piece, just you know, sort of questioning why born frees should vote for Swapo based on this narrative of um, apartheid liberators and you know, you, you know, loyalty and all of that. When my argument was, well, I was born, you know, I grew up in democracy, so that doesn't resonate with me. So what else have you done? And there was and a lot of controversy around your piece, as I recall. It was a huge controversy, and yes, it was and it was so that. bizarre. But I think if that piece was published now, I think people would just be like, yeah. Um, maybe some people wouldn't wouldn't like it, but other people would say exactly. I, this is what I agree with. Right. I'd frame it. Yeah, she should. She <laughs> I'll send you a copy. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm not really sure what's 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 going on there because, as much as there is more um, critique in in these um, sort of respected and entrenched media institutions in the country, there's also sort of this uh, backlash and, and I don't know if it's tied to this distrust of, of the media and the idea that the media is, you know, somehow against the political um, establishment. establishment. And right. I think maybe people connect the political establishment with democracy. Right. So they think that if, the, you know, if, uh, if it's a threat to the political establishment and to the whole idea of politics, it's a threat to democracy, but it's completely the other way around, you know? Absolutely. The media is, you know, the fourth estate. We talk about mm. how it's literally the media's job to hold the political establishment accountable and therefore give the people the power that they need in order to make decisions come election time, come right. you know, petition time, come protest time, come you know, debate time. I don't know if it's a generational thing. I know that a lot of, a lot of young people use social media and a lot of um, outlets and, and, and activists are using social media a lot more now. And I think maybe there is, you know, that's where there's space for people to be more accepting of social media right. as a space. Right. Um, but it's just very, it's very bizarre for me to see how, you know, as much as we've, we've really adopted social media as a way to share information, there's still this weird, um, I don't know, suspicion. Well, it's also a very dangerous place to be for women and so on. I mean, there are plenty of surveys being done about how, if you're different or express different views, or if you're a woman uh, with opinions, that often, you know, the, it is really vicious, the attacks that can emanate on social media. And I know a few people who fled for the mountains and said, not me, I'm not going near that. So it's not a safe space. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we need to do more, obviously, to, to fix that. But I'm also wondering to what extent... And I believe this Trump's America is a lot of the cause or the reason for a lot of this distrust in the media. I mean, he came up with a fake news thing. And of course, most governments, let's be absolutely honest, not necessarily only our own, but most others don't like criticism. They don't. And so that sort of whole fake news thing fed into that. And that's what probably upsets me the most is that politicians are probably all celebrating the fact that the people are turning against the media when not so long ago, certainly in my era, the newspaper was like a Bible, if I may use that phrase, to many people who needed that to get the truth of what was happening. So what are your thoughts around this, Omar? How do we sort of deal with this question? What Trump did, um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's solely on him. You know that saying, you said it, but I was thinking it? A lot of people held that sentiments, but he went up there and used the world's most powerful office to amplify those sentiments. It was like a brewing pot and he opened the lid, you know? Right. And he did it misogynistically, right. homophobically, xenophobically, and all the isms. Um, 
So on the question about the criticism of the president and, you know, um, regulating uh, uh, the internet access or social media, I would say that in Africa, I think there is very much still loyalty to liberation movements, loyalty to elders and loyalty to parties. And that's why it sometimes translates. Do you think so? Yeah. I think in the older generation, yes. And in the younger generation, it's a bit more... Um, people have liberated themselves from the shackles that their parents have held them to, to certain parties and persons, you know? Yeah. But that means that the alternative that we as a youth choose should not just be a bandage, but an actual um, alternative that will bring hope and meaningful change. Right. Um, But to just go back to the question, I, I think that loyalty to government and that translates into those statistics. Um, But what I do want to say about um, uh, the 60% of Namibians who think that internet access should remain unrestricted, uh, right? Right. Yeah. So I think that is a good thing. But why don't we first talk about the fact that internet access is not accessible across the vast majority of Namibia. That's that's a good point, you know? yes. So like, yeah, we are, we are focusing on the fact that it should be unrestricted, and I agree, but internet access is a public good, and it is a public commodity also, so to say. Sure. So we should make sure that the, pe- the people in Zambezi, the people in the heartland of Hardap, that in- they first have access to internet, and then we can talk about regulating it, because I think good regulation should come. But I don't even trust my government to be the regulating Absolutely force at not. all. No. Like, I don't even trust them with, with my destiny at this point as a youth right. in this country. And also, it's just so sad that, or disheartening to see um, the ombudsman, both the media ombudsman and the ombudsman, not effectively holding what's happening in the media to account. I mean, when Eagle FM went out there and over the village and said these things, I expected the ombudsman to step in and hold them to account. He has to get a complaint, though, the media ombudsman to act. Yeah. And which he did, but at least from Equal Namibia, but exactly. we haven't seen anything, you right. know. Good so, point. so I think that they needs to they need to step in a little bit more, and um, I would like to see that happen. Um, as soon as possible to save like um, our democracy. And yes, freedom of speech is pivotal, but we've seen how hate speech has um, pushed people to the brink of democracy and into autocracy as well. Mm -hmm. So um, freedom of speech, yes, but we have an obligation to make sure it's also not hate speech that should not be permitted in a born free Namibia. The other thing I want to, I know you want to say something, Dapwe, and I'm wondering if you can answer this while you do make your point, and that is that, is it not a fact that people are becoming more conservative and more right-wing, even in Africa? I say this because you know with the topic of abortion at the moment, the big thinking is now, because government clearly doesn't want to deal with what is a hot potato and take the initiative mm. and, and, and legalize it, um, so they want to talk about a referendum. Now, I think all of us sitting here would probably agree that if we had a referendum, on abortion or on the death penalty, that in although we can't, people don't realize death penalty cannot be changed. But if we had to have a referendum on either of those two, that the overwhelming majority of Namibians would vote against. Um, certainly, uh, they'd want the death penalty if they could have it, and they would vote against uh, the pro-choice movement as far as abortion is concerned. Which is concerned. contradictory. Exactly. So in that way, government very conveniently shifts it off them and says, let the majority decide. But the majority isn't always right. Dapo, you want to, as you answer the other issue, I refer mean, to that? Yeah, I think that, like you said, a referendum would be disastrous because there's just not enough, I think, groundswell of people who could turn the tide against this this conservatism. And I think also the issue is that a lot of this conservatism has been um, very underground. People haven't been very vocal necessarily about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but now that you have uh, movements that are coming out and especially young people that are coming out and being very, very clear about what their rights are exactly. and their demands um, and what their demands are, I think that that is sort of invigorating a lot of these conservative groups to take action sort of in response to that, which is extremely upsetting. Right. Um, it's, it's really frustrating because there's almost this 
I often f I find with um, the older generation of really conservative people, there's, there almost seems to be this idea of, of, of punishing young people. Mm -hmm. um, and like Omar was saying, there is this, uh, you know, there's this lingering sort of effect of, you know, the idea of respecting your elders and, you know, really acknowledging what they've done. And, you know, we, for, for my generation, born free generation, I think we were kind of raised with the idea that like politicians are, are so great and why wow, we should really look up to them, but not with the idea that they are civil servants and therefore they are employed by me. They work for me, you know, at the end exactly. of the day. Yeah. All the people who are sitting in the National Assembly, regardless of the party that they represent, um, are supposed to be working in the service of me as a person. And I think that there's a disconnect there with these really conservative people. Like, they're, I don't necessarily think that they approach um, politicians and politics in that way. Right. And I think young people are more involved or more aware of the fact that politics is not just what happens in the National Assembly and what happens in the National Council, but, you know, is it, am I free to walk down the street at night? Um, you know, if I am a trans person and I go to the police to report a crime, will I be safe there? Will I be heard there? Will anything happen there? Um, and I think that we need sort of a shift in our understanding of what politics Absolutely. Is. Well, it's just about anything, isn't it? Yeah. And at, at the same time, just another thing that I really was, was thinking about as we were talking about, you know, um, the ombudsman and the media ombudsman and, and just generally thinking of how these public figures interact with the media. It's very strange because when you think about it, I think politicians really miss an opportunity to engage with people through the media and really strengthen people's idea of what their platform is. And I think a lot of times it comes um, because of party politics, you know, coming yeah. at the top, that's the main priority and everything else is, is you know, is supplementary, exactly. I don't know, secondary. secondary. Yes. Mm. So, um, you know, I know I've, been, I've spoken with MPs um, from various parties who will say, I don't necessarily agree with what people are saying, but I cannot broach that in Parliament, right. in National Assembly, because, you know, we have internal processes to deal with that. And... That's also incredibly frustrating because it sort of defeats the purpose for you to be sitting in the National Assembly, mm -hmm. disagreeing with what people are talking about. You know, maybe you think that we should legalize abortion, but you are not able to voice that. You're not able to go to the media and say, I'm a member of SWAPO. I don't agree with, you know, what the majority of people are saying. Exactly. I can still be a member of this party and still mm -hmm. represent you. But now it's sort of this idea of like this party represents themselves and their own ideas and you can you know follow them if you want to or you can find another party and that kind of defeats the whole idea of, of democracy totally, to me i totally. mean that's 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 really something that has been on my mind a lot i mean obviously we can't change the constitution right, and right. change our whole political system right. but it's like a, a huge flaw that i think we don't talk about enough i think what you're speaking about is something i i i've also picked up what's happening in this country is members of par parliament and members of political office putting party before people, profits before people, and never country before party. And that resonates more or less across Africa. So why is it then that people trust the media at about the same level as they distrust politicians? This I find very hard yeah, yeah. to figure out. Yeah, yeah I, think it's, I think it's because... Uh, government has politicized the media so much, you know. I mean, as a young person viewing the government from the outside, I've seen how my president has treated media like, you know, a vaslap, right. you know. Right. And like um, the disrespect uh, when journalists ask substantial questions, mm. questions I, as a public, am want sitting with. Exactly. And I want the answers exactly. to them. Thank you for doing your job, the journalist. But how dare you ask me that question is the perception I'm getting from my president who's supposed to serve me. Right. So if a president can shunt a, a journalist around like that, a member of parliament, a secretary of a party, literally saying, I'm too busy sweeping, I can't talk about people's civil rights, then of course people are also going to have that same energy to journalists. If I may just quickly talk about LGBTQ rights, Namibians aren't homophobic. Afrobarometer puts us at 55% tolerance, top four in Africa. Mm -hmm. Ombudsman's study uh, uh, showed that 73% of Namibians believe in civil and human rights protections for LGBTQ persons. But they see how government promotes state-sanctioned homophobic laws and targets LGBTQ right. persons, right. and then they internalize that too. 
They internalize exactly. what government does. Mm-hmm. If you look at the corruption that's happening, of course people in Namibia are, are corrupt. Of course people in trans trans Namib and and in and Nasfaf, all these power status are corrupt because they internalize what the government is doing. Right. So that's why, if I can draw it back to your central question, is the treatment or the energy from public given to journalism mm. is basically just a mirror image of how the government treats the journalists. Right. And if I may just touch on the abortion uh, conversation we've been having, what I've seen transpire, and I'm not sure if you're aware or seen, we put this out on the social, about these public hearings, mm. is nothing short of undemocratic. It was disheartening and disgusting, frankly, to our republic what happened in Wolfish Bay and how the members of parliament hosted a biased, unfair, and I would frankly say unapproved and illegal abortion hearing. Uh, these, These members of parliament came in and they gave everybody three minutes to speak which is fair. We got to get through everybody's sentiments. This is a community town hall. Let's hear what you have to say. Right. A public hearing or consultation is for members of parliament to go to community, find out the community sentiments, report back to parliament, right. and them as our elected representatives right. are the ones obligated to vote. Right. Not us, especially with their unapproved referendum. Exactly. Um, but what they did was they, they gave the pro-life uh, people 10 minutes to testify. A woman came up and testified for 10 minutes and even gave her a chair to sit down about an abortion she had that she regrets. So we asked the members of parliament for us to then also uh, come up there and play a voice note of someone from Wolfish Bay who had to sell her shack just to be able to go to South Africa and get an abortion. That's 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 yeah, a that's fair, the reality. yeah. And they basically called the police up to the to the stage to escort me off while I was demanding an equal uh, due process of time. Yeah. And then they also held a referendum, a referendum that wasn't certified or approved by Parliament. They asked the members in the town hall at the end to vote. A lot of the pro-choice uh, uh, supporters stood up and walked out because throughout the hearing, pro-choice people were being screamed at from members of the religious background, from pro-life coalition. Their time was being affected, and literally they were being intimidated. So how are you going to be able to openly vote on something with such a close community if you're already stigmatized and ostracized? Mm-hmm. This is a contentious thing. Sure. You cannot host a vote. You are the one supposed to v- a vote right. on it. So it was completely disheartening. A part that was not won through a referendum, civil rights cannot be won through a referendum. Mm-hmm. Because if this goes to a referendum, then women should only vote. Right. And if we allow this to happen, watch how they'll do the same with decriminalizing of sodomy. Because if that happens, then only LGBTQ persons are supposed to go and go vote. But right. that is not an equal um, right. prerequisite. So right. it's it's disheartening. But then do you, and all of that is, is fascinating, Omar, but do you think the media are representing those issues that, you, I mean, are they putting them out in the public domain and and giving giving air yeah. to, to those? Because uh, just briefly, perhaps, before yes. we move on to the next I'm question. going to give credit where credit is due, and I will say yes. Right, it okay. is because that's important. Yes. Um, I am so happy to live in a country where I am able to be visible and advocate for these things because the media in Namibia are amplifying our voices about reproductive justice, about sexual gender-based violence, about LGBTQ issues. Some get it wrong. Some get it wrong and sometimes dangerously wrong, but the vast majority gets it right. And that is what being born free means to me. That's excellent. A good way of putting it. Because as I say, I think that's critical. The media is there Mm -hmm. to speak truth to power. Is it doing that? And when it does so properly, it earns back, I think, the trust of those communities. It may have lost. Dapwe, you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, I mean, it it is really wonderful to see, as Omar was saying, that so many um, media institutions are reporting on um, issues that previously were completely ignored. You know, we had this right. phrase of vulnerable communities, which was just sure. sort of a catch-all sure. for everyone yeah. else, you know, all the others. Um, but, you know, I think at the same time, I, well, maybe this is, I think, where a shift is, is actually happening, where there is representation of these issues, and there are public conversations about feminism, about mental health, about exactly. racism, about internalized racism, sure. about misogyny. All of these things are being spoken about more, and I wish I could see more of that sort of critical engagement filtering into the news and as okay. as it is reported. Okay. Um, you know, I think in the past I've read you know articles from all newspapers where you know the minister of gender said that um, you know men instead of this is a 
very loose quote, but instead of beating your wife, you should go out and find another partner. And, really? I and, mean... And, and, and I mean, and then that's just reported, and the headline is, you know, Minister of Gender speaks on, you know, GBV. But the headline should be, Minister of exactly. Gender completely misses the point um, and, you know, doesn't, con doesn't condemn gender-based violence. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, sort of just proposes that men go and, you know, practice infidelity to, you know, I don't know, to avoid, yeah. you know, yeah. to avoid being forced to beat their wife, like God forbid. So okay. that to me is, is, is something that I would like to see more of. And I think I see it on social media more than I see it. In also, media. just to say, I think from what you've both said, what you feel the media may fall short a bit on is the issue of context, yes. Yes. which I think is important. The second thing is from what Omar has also just said, some media get it right. Some media get it wrong, but the main thing, certainly from a journalistic perspective, is those who get it wrong must rectify quickly. I mean, that is something... And be held to account. Exactly. Most, exactly, in the same way as politicians. Yeah. Most serious journalists would believe that, you, you know, everybody has the right to reply and you must correct yeah. facts. Uh, let's face it, we're all human and yeah. we can all make mistakes and there is a big difference between... And I don't know, the world's media don't seem to have got this yet, but misinformation, I always say to people who don't know the difference, M, misinformation, mistake, i.e. I tell in Dapwa the way to Okahania is to turn left, right, and go straight. And I might have got it wrong, but I'm not intentionally trying to get her to go to Rehoboth. Instead, I've just made a mistake. And disinformation is something that is absolutely deliberate and mm. put out there to cause societal harm and drama yeah. in, in all of the areas we've, we've spoken about. Just quickly, mm -hmm. the issues of press freedom and democracy and so on, do you not think that this, there may be this rather depressing scenario for ourselves in Africa, mainly because economics bites hard? People are poor, they are marginalized, they are dispossessed, they can't put food on the table, why would they care about things like media freedom and access to information when they just have to eke out a living from day to day? Number one, is that or could that be factored in? The second thing is the news people want isn't necessarily the news they need. We know that from social media, right? And to, as you earlier alluded, uh, Ndapwa, to be informed citizens in a democracy and to build a knowledge-based society, are people getting the kind of information in order to drive towards that goal? Do the facts matter any more to them, is another question. Um, and if you look overall, there are very few institutions that are trusted at all anymore. If you even look, people don't trust science anymore, right? Yeah. You look at the COVID pandemic and the anti-vax movement and- Global warming. So, exactly, so this distrust seems to be manifest not just in the media, but across the board. And final question, if you can both make your concluding remarks, is what do you believe serious journalists can do, whether their reporting is online or in print, to give citizens the news and information that they both want, but also that they need in order for us to build stronger democracies? I know it's a mouthful. Sorry, guys. Who's, who's first? Omar. Okay. Omar. okay. <laughs> <clears throat> So regarding press freedoms and economics, I think they are both interdependent, if that is the correct sure. way to, or correct word to say. I think that your economic situation can improve if, press, if the press are there and if the freedom of the press is there to hold government to account. Excellent. Good um, point. Press freedom mm. can bring about change of government that can bring out uh, substantial policy change. Okay. Uh, universal basic income is a topic of discussion because the media is amplifying um, that issue, which can lift so much destitute people out of poverty right. and improve their socioeconomic positions. Right. But I'm not saying that um, just because people are reporting that they can like alleviate poverty, you know, that's not really the media's job. The media's job is to report facts. So how how what how are you in that? destitute socioeconomic position. Why are you there? 
and we can find out why you're there through investigative journalism, through sure. freedom of the press, um, to find out like what policy positions have put you there, right. what incompetent leadership has put you there, what lackluster government has put you there. How can we Get uplift you, out. you? Yes. So <laughs> right. it's community, and we are one in the same, and we're interdependent in those two realms. Informed citizens and how, how we can become better informed citizens. Pass the access to information bill today. Right, right, right. Today, that is a a, 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 a a meaningful bill to continue to elevate our country. And um, if that bill was in place, perhaps we would have known the corruption that was happening, yeah. not just with fish rot, but years ago. Yeah. And um, people like, like me, like an active citizen, can have easier access to my elected representatives, can have easier Absolutely. access to finding out like procurement information or whatnot. I want to applaud civil society for putting together this bill. Right. It's, um, it's, it, I would love to see more members of parliament champion it and I know uh, Honourable Theophilus is is one and it's good to see a youth champion um, such that. an important issue but it should not be taking this long. Parliament had four bills only in 2021 right. on on, on on, 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 in the August House. They've only passed one, and that's your appropriation bill. So they made sure they fund their pockets. Exactly. Where is our COVID relief? Where is uh, jobs for the fishermen and NMOB employees? Where is student debt relief for NASVAF per, uh, persons? Right. But you made sure you passed the appropriation bill. Yeah. Access to information should be passed as soon as possible yeah. to continue to strengthen our democracy. Thank you. I think that's very succinct. Uh, a summary there, Omar. And again, lack of political will and how the media must hold politicians to account on these very issues. Dapwa. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I love what you said, Omar, about you know the importance of investigative journalism because it, what it does is it connects those individual stories and lived experiences to the big picture. Exactly. Uh, and also, you know, sort of can, has the ability to highlight to people what avenues there are for them to take to uh, make their voices heard or to access you know, services that they may need to right. access. Um, when it comes to access to information, I think that's also a huge issue because I, you know, my, my hugest pet peeve with the government, well, not my hugest, but one of them, is you try to access a government website and your computer says, no, it's not safe, first of all. Then you try again. Right. You get there. The name of the ministry is different from the current name of the ministry. The information hasn't been updated. If I go on to, you know, Absolutely. if I Google how to get a protection order in Namibia, I don't know. And right. And, you know, there are people who are, this is a plug for Sister Namibia, who are about to release a video that we've produced on the steps you need to take. Excellent, but, good. But that is the kind of information that people need to have, you know, how to get relief, financial assistance, Absolutely. all sorts of things. And so I think that, you know, for serious journalists, taking that into account and always kind of having in the back of their mind, how is this information useful to the most marginalized people? Yeah. Because it's not, it's not enough for the you know, middle class and upper class to read things and say, mm, yes, that's very interesting right. and that's relevant to me because, oh, share prices are falling or whatever. But how is that going to have an impact on the most marginalized people? Because it right. will. I think regardless of, of how big the issue may seem, it will always sort of have a trickle down impact. And especially when it comes to reporting on financial news and, and the economy, uh, I think making those connections and humanizing yeah. what's, you know, sometimes very cold data and information, humanizing that is going to be so important for journalists going forward. Yeah, I often say also to my colleagues in the Action Coalition, you know, we started working on the bill 2016. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, for me, the main concern is we are shouting into the ether here. But why is it that we don't have resounding, overwhelming public support for an ATI bill that people take to the streets yeah. and say, we need this now? Why? Because it's for the benefit of everyone, not least of all the journalists who often come a, against, a bri and researchers, yeah. a brick wall of secrecy when it comes to trying to get information. People don't take that into account where they say, oh, journalists don't do their work. But it's difficult sometimes. And Dapwa has given some very succinct examples of how difficult it is to access good information and how much further that would take us mm -hmm. and how much more accountable it would make government to the people and for media to, to benefit from that as well. Yeah. Omar. If I just may, I just want to say, hey, um, for those that, if I refer to our previous question, that see government and journalists as, you know, both mis misinformation machines, let me say that Recon Africa 
is going to lose their um, their drilling rights and uh, their exploration rights because of the work of the journalists going to the community and amplifying the situation there. Um, I've seen for the first time members of parliament hold ministries account to account for giving an uh, approving an illegal license. And that is because the spotlight on Recon Africa locally has been so, so impactful. Mm -hmm. Locally, like it is local journalists that, has, uh, that have saved our environment and civil society and activists as well. And then also, we would not be knowing to the level that we do now, what has transpired from the fish rod case, if the Namibian did not fight for access to information and freedom of the press in our courts of law. And those are the two case studies I want Namibians to ponder on. Would we be where we are in those two scenarios if we did not have, have journalists media. and media fighting Digging for what's right? Yeah. No, thank you both. But what I'm glad about is that both of you and your views and opinions are not mirrored by in this sort of huge distrust in the media. Um, whatever the case is really on the ground, uh, media is necessary, a free and independent media for democracy to thrive and survive. And I think it's important people hold media to account. You've given some examples. When they do wrong, they must also, it must be pointed out and they must do what it needs to be done mm -hmm. to, to put things right about. And they must up their game. I mean, those of us who decades in the profession know that we need to take the craft of journalism to new heights yeah. and not try and bring it down to clickbait and try and compete with social media. Let's do our thing, do our investigative reporting mm -hmm. in the public interest, bring back, I think, in that way, hopefully the public support and some revenue that the media can continue uh, doing the work of journalism. So both of you, thank you so much for some great observations about this topic and maybe we can do a part two yes. going forward. Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you and thank, thank you, Gwen. You. Thanks, Gwen. <laughs>